So what we have here are five short slides and we're envisioning 25 minutes. And this is one of the slides. We're certainly not gonna spend, ooh, yeah, I do get that <laughs> band of white. Um, we're certainly not gonna spend five minutes on that. But the idea was to engage as much conversation as possible and to, um, it can be something relevant to what's on the screen. It can just be, hey, I have a different kind of question. Okay, bring it on. That's that's our pleasure. Because everybody's at different ages and stages with the death doula concept. And a lot of people um, would say, I'd really know, I'd really like to know a lot about it. I don't know anything about it. So they don't know enough to ask a question. Some people have had a little experience and they can ask questions. Uh, I will start right now with the term death doula that that was its original name and that was because it's comparable to the birth doula. So it's helping people go through a transition. But death doula was creepy <laughs> to a lot of people. And so then the next iteration was end of life doula. And that's a little bit better but it still puts some people off. And as this is an emerging profession, it is an emerging term. So it's developing and going different ways. One of my favorite educators is Sarah Kerr, K-E-R-R -R, at the center. She's from Canada. So center is spelled C-E-N-T-R-E -E for sacred death care. And she uses the term death walker because you walk with people through the death process. And she, she put out a question in one of the classes I took saying, well, what should the term be? And somebody said, well, death walker sounds a lot like death stalker. <laughs> <laughs> so it's really in flux. So we're talking about death doula, but it's the same as end of life doula. It's the same as death walker. And there might be another term that becomes more universally acceptable um, in time. So let's go to the next slide. Okay, so what does a death doula do? Well, the easiest thing is what a death doula does not do, and they don't do anything medical. So where um, a hospice nurse or somebody like that can have the capacity to do medical things, some people who can do medical things are also death doula, but they're completely different things but related in intent. Um, so what does it do? Well, this was sort of my smart ass answer, which I mentioned to my friend in Canada. And he said, I like that. And said, <laughs> so it's whatever most needs to be done, but how are you gonna do that? Well, you're gonna have to walk in and spend time with everyone who's involved. And a lot of times people are just uneasy. One of the things that overlays uh, our situation in the U.S. is that we're a Western culture. And in the West, we don't talk about death. And in fact, until Elizabeth Kugler-Ross came along, we didn't even talk to death to people who were involved in dying. We put them back in a hall um, and where they could die peacefully back by the back of the nurse's station. And I'm sure, well, I certainly remember people in that situation. Um, she was chastised. She took some dying people and gave them the opportunity to speak to medical students. And she was told that she was um, exhorting, is that the right word? The uh, the dead people or the dying people. That that was, Jeez. yeah, that that was absolutely immoral and inappropriate and they shouldn't do that. Huh. And she was a feisty little soul. And, she fought against that. But until she was here and she just died, I don't know, a decade or so ago, um, you just didn't talk to dying patients. You didn't tell them that they were dying. <laughs> um, you just kind of tried to make them feel better without giving them any information, which is horrifying at this point, right? So um, this is new that we spend time with dying people to understand their needs and to, um, to see what, what makes them better. And on this is a heavy element of allaying fear. Western culture, you die, you're gone. 
<coughs> you, you never exist. Most other cultures, we ancestors, we honor our ancestors. We have ceremonies. We talk about them um, because we're not afraid. Because we see life as a cycle, and I think if we and this is I don't have statistics on this, but I think if we looked at um, cultures, there are more cultures who believe in the cycle of life that just like the plants, we come and we go and we come and we go and um, we turn into compost in the meantime. So there's this nurturing and progressive kind of a thing. So one of the first things that you want to do when you talk to these people is figure out where they are and don't try to talk them out of it, but just talk to them there and maybe share where you are if it's appropriate. What you have to what you think is a lot less important than what they're feeling. So you just kind of follow, follow your, your nose on that. So you, your client can be the person who's dying. It can be the family of the mm. people who's dying. Um, and in that case, you pick up on any dissension that's going on and help people individually and help people um, who could help but are hesitating to do so. I think most of us or many of us know a story of somebody who was dying and people were sitting around waiting for them to die. And then usually it's a nurse says, somebody needs to tell him that it's okay to die and to give him permission. And then he does, and then he's gone. So there is this inactivity. It's not an inert sort of thing. Um, so this could be going on with the patient themselves, with their family members, their caregivers. You got to take care of the caregivers. This is a heavy duty load for the caregivers. Whether they're getting paid for it or not, they are giving deeply and they need to be nurtured to help them identify what needs to, to be done and according to their own lights. Um, the fear of death is a good example. Are you afraid of dying? Well, yeah. Well, what are you afraid of? Are you afraid it's going to hurt? Are you afraid what's it going to feel like? Are you afraid who's going to take care of my family when I'm gone? And most people haven't gotten down to that level of um, think about. Uh, that, that level of addressing what they have to address. I have a friend who's 82 years old, very smart, very wonderful. I said, you have a will, don't you? Oh, I guess I ought to do that. <laughs> he said, yeah, I think you should. <laughs> so he went right out and did it. Yeah, that's, that's right. Yeah. So, because he, he didn't have any family, so he just was going to sort of let it happen. So, um, so, so that's that's a concern that was, I think it was in the back of his head, but there was nobody that was pushing him to consider it. Uh, and he felt a lot better he, once once he actually did it. And uh, your pet, if it were me, I would be worried about my pet, whose birthday is today. Um, and so you want to have plans for how that's going to be handled, how that'll work out. If they're afraid, well, is it going to hurt? Well, there's some very logical scientific explanations for that. This is what you can expect. This will happen, this will happen, this will happen. This will happen. We can handle it. We can, we've got all that handled. So all these things you need to plumb their understanding to know what needs to be done. And if you need to find somebody else, if you need to find an attorney to make a will for them, you can do that. Or usually, my experience, it's enough just to bubble up the question and they can take care of it themselves. So does anybody have any thoughts or questions at this point? Then we will just go on. Um, and uh, Pam, you mentioned, if I might. Please. Um, you said, tell them what to expect. Are you talking physically and emotionally? But what are you what are you saying for them to 
what needs to um, for them what to expect. Great, thank or you. Is that too broad a subject, or you may be coming to that later? No, no, I'm not. I'm not. I'm just sort of feeling my way through this. So um, it can go either way, and if they specifically say, "I'm afraid of whether whether it's going to hurt," then you go there and you explain, or you have a hospice nurse or somebody explain what mm -hmm. typically happens and how things are handled with medication mm -hmm. and the warning signs of when you need these things. Mm -hmm. You can go right into that. If uh, their concern, and I would think that they would be less likely to express this freely, but if their concern is, is it, how sad is it gonna be? How am I gonna feel when this happens? Um, then, you go there and, and you talk about uh, resources to um, to help you along with that. Um, and if it's if it's the caregivers or or the family, one of the ones that I think is particularly important is to talk about grief versus grief work. And there's going to be grief, and grief is part of the healing. And so no one should feel like you have to lessen the grief. But the grief work is all the stuff that you say, oh man, I wish I had. And when I say that, I'm including the person who's dying. I'm picturing him on the other side saying, why didn't I tell her how much I love her? Why didn't I tell her how proud I am? So you try to get to those sorts of things. That's unfinished business. Things that they wish that they would have said or have done. Um, that you, you do it now while you can. A lot of people like to take a, a handprint. Well, you can actually do that after somebody dies, but wouldn't it be nice to do it together? Um, conversations to be had, photographs to be taken. I wish I'd taken a photograph of them when we were all together. Well, don't let yourself be open to that. Think of all the things because again, Dilma is not just working with the dying person. Dilma is working with all these people and say, have you thought about such and so? Or would you like to have done such and so? So it's both kinds of uh, unfinished business. And the unfinished business minimizes the grief work, but not the grief. And so it's important to be able to distinguish between the grief and the grief work. Thank you. Grief is part of the show. Mm -hmm. the more you love the more you hurt I think quite often um, but you can lessen the things that make you hit your forehead um, mm -hmm. so. does that address your question but thank you very much Pam I appreciate it okay um oh okay take care of those and then I think of it all as, as kind of a dance a choreographed dance and I was so pleased. Last night I was reading um, Gabby Jimenez, who's one of the ultimate death or death workers, as far as I'm concerned. And she called herself a choreographer. And I said, yes. <laughs> um, and what I love about Gabby, well, a lot of her, her skills, um, but she does her work by giving the skills to her clients clients, not just the person who's died. And so at the end of the day, they have this wonderful heartfelt feeling of, I helped to make this happen. And I think that's a lovely thing. So um, Gabby's published and she publishes little worksheets for uh, two or three page leaflets for certain skills so she could hand those um, to her clients. And at some point, I might get there too. Um, but I think that's a wonderful aspect that you are giving the skills to the people who are involved. So they come out not only with those skills, but with a feeling of accomplishment and contribution. When you're building a strong community that way as well, giving away so many of the tools mm -hmm. that people will need again in the future. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The inevitability of the need of those tools. Right. And then they... Again, whether they give them or model them, mm. they give them to their friends. Yeah, give them a model. Um, so let's face it, we're all going to need these. 
So it's satisfying to be prepared. Um, okay. <laughs> this was funny. I, I uh, was talking to a friend of mine in Canada, and this is one of these people that when you, when I contact him, he'll say, oh, I was just thinking of contacting you this morning, and, and I did the same thing. And interestingly, he and his wife came down to visit, I guess about six or eight months ago, and they'd never been to Raleigh. Mm -hmm. And I was not even close to doing this kind of work. And where did I take them? To Oakwood Cemetery. <laughs> not usually top on anybody's hit parade, but they loved it. So I absolutely loved it. We spent a lot of time here. So I told him about this. I mean, this is my smart ass answer. And he said, I love it. Use it. And then he added this. And I thought, I love that. I'm going to use that. So again, you did different for each person depending on their beliefs, openness, and spirituality. So you speak their language the best that you can. You don't, and you don't argue with them about their language. You just tailor your message to what they're ready to hear because that's a stressful time for them. So it's especially important, I think, to, to do that. So, any other questions? Then it says, Gabby, said it, the person you mentioned, Gabby, someone? Gabby Jimenez. Jimenez. Uh, J-I-M-E-N-E-Z. And you know, I didn't do it before, but I will be sending everybody on the list um, a copy of the um, the handout with the resources to okay. get out before, but you can expect it at the end of our presentation, an email with Pam's resources in it. Thank you, Bree. Thank you. Interesting sidelight about Gabby. You know, I just read this the other night too. That she used to be a construction safety worker <laughs> and she lost her job and one thing led to another and she found herself in this kind of work. And she's really maybe the most outstanding uh, nurse kind of person who's in this right now so um and you know i work for ibm i work for queen dials i didn't train for this either but i did because as i look back on it i can see how things that i learned along the way um make me e easier to plug into this so so these come from canada first yeah, well, the, the proof came from Kent. Oh, and it's from this, a gentleman here, friend. This one came yeah. straight from Kent. Yeah, <laughs> so. Okay, so this is introductory. So it's just to give you a taste. I hope it's like dark chocolate and you want more. <laughs> and we can kind of explore together. So I would, I would love that. But why would you continue? Well, you might want to be a deaf doer. And you might want to do that formally as a business uh, or consider doing that. Or you might just want to be able to do that and enjoy having the skills um, and the opportunities to use them. And I, mean, I will tell you, you'll get hooked because you just, my experience has been that I just feel better about understanding the cycle of life and why things happen, get a better view of why things might be happening and how they fit into my own overall life perspective. Um, and to better understand how people I know react in ways that surprise me. And then I put it into that perspective. Well, how do they see what's going on? And oh, I get it. And, and that doesn't mean I have to change it or change them. That just means I, I better understand. So for me, it helps me to better understand what's going on. Now, if you want to be a death doula, or perhaps you are a death doula, um, Bree maintains registry here at, at Oakwood, and it's beautifully simple. It's a notebook, one of those notebooks with a pocket for different business cards. And that's all it is. This is a registry. This is not a recommendation. We can't get into that business for all kinds of reasons. Um, but you can put your, your card, give it to Bree, and she'll put it in a notebook over here. And when somebody says, I'd like to talk about death doula, she can say, well, here's the cards. And if you have a business, you'll probably have a website. 
and you may have a really short, this is the marketing, so it's about marketing. This is the marketing part of me. On your business card, you want to have a very short, we're talking three to five words, statement of what you do or why you do it or anything like that, and a website. And then go to your website, tell your story. People want to relate to people. They don't want to relate to a business. They want to relate to people. And tell your story. And that's where you get people interested in talking with you or not, whether or not it's a good fit. So if you decide you want to be in the business of being a death doula, talk to Bree. <laughs> um, another reason is to assist your own family and friends. It's uh, just kind of a natural thing. And there's so much remoteness right now that if you know someone who really needs some help, but they don't have it available and they're so much in need of help that they don't know how to get help, you could give them a doula. You could find a doula in their area and say, why don't you just go spend some time with this person and see if it helps and then you can get feedback and if it helps or not. But I think this one in this day and age of isolation and remoteness is gonna be more and more of an appropriate gift. Mm -hmm. so. Okay, questions? I'm gonna start by you said this earlier about kind of le how learning about death kind of almost makes you better at living. I think so. Yeah, yeah. I think mean, that's really interesting. Yeah. It's sort of, it's almost, we all go to therapy to sort of learn these tools to make us better humans and learning this thing, learning about ourselves in this way. Yes. I hadn't really clicked in that way. That yes. Way. Yes. Very and if you're a country music fan, in the background, you can be hearing Tim McGraw singing Live Like You Were Dying, <laughs> um, which I think speaks to when his own dad, Tug McGraw, um, was dying. And so you've got time left. Live it. So. And my intention on the live is to understand life as much as possible. And it certainly helps to do that. So that's the basics of what I want to introduce. Now I'm going to tell you my own story. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to give you a sheet of references in case you want to explore some more on your own. And briefs that the one Brie was talking about, she would send down. So. Mm -hmm. It's fine. Okay, so can you read this or shall I read it to you? Please read it. Okay, all right. You'll recognize some of this. <laughs> How did I get here? Don't you just love being associated with a cemetery filled with life? Did you know that's the tagline of historic Oakwood Cemetery? This isn't just a bunch of old stuff lying here doing nothing. This joint is jumping. I know I do. It comes naturally for me. The house where I was born was bordered by two cemeteries and a grassy field with old red barn. This was our playground and where my older brother, who Betsy knows quite well, and I began to learn to honor the dead and respect the lives that they had lived. As I grew up, I went to various schools, loved to learn something new, married and had three children, all of whom are now happily married and are raising my six grandchildren. I worked for various companies, ranging from large corporations to very small companies. One, one of my entrepreneurial clients paid me in dresses. He was just starting and he didn't have any money, but he needed some marketing help. So he gave me three dresses, one for me, one for my mother, and one for Kimberly, my daughter-in-law. And that we were all happy with that, so that was fine. Um, I particularly enjoyed the travel that these jobs offered, permitting me to experience and appreciate the differences of cultures, which comes in handy now when I'm looking at the way the Western culture treats death as opposed to some of the other cultures out there. Not surprisingly, such travels often included visits to various cemeteries, and I still do that. So I've just drawn to that. 
Um, a couple of years ago, I was introduced to the concept of death doulas, and on the next slide, the reference slide, which Bree's going to send you a copy, you'll see how that happened. And my interpretation of the form is it's a form of, of it is, it's a form of choreography. <laughs> After gathering insights to all those in, impacted by the principle, the doula can help create a kind of dance that speaks to a collection of needs and wishes of all those impacted by the death. Sometimes, not each and every need or wish can be fulfilled, but most can be honored. With forethought, encouragement, and coaching, everyone impacted by the death, including the one nearing death, can better savor the dance, soften the grief, and minimize the work. The fear. Grief is an important part of the healing process and need not be eliminated. These concepts are what brought me to this work. Beautiful memories can be created, to be cherished forever. And that's our goal. So even when somebody feels better, well, you're doing something right then, but that's going to be a beautiful memory going into eternity. So that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. That's how I got here. Thank you. And so my path, my initial resources, Zach Bush is a doctor that kind of came to the fore um, during COVID. He became more well-known. I learned about him after I had colon surgery and I had to recuperate for several months. So I thought, well, I'll take something online. Then he had a great course uh, online which was not about death and dying, but he went on to set up a knowledge base about all kinds of things. Highly respect him. Um, so I'm, he's just good, a good source, Zach Bush. And his website is zachbushmd.com, which is on this sheet that you're mm -hmm. going to get, so you don't have to worry about getting it. And it's very challenging to navigate. So I put how to navigate in here. And there's a section on death and dying. And man, I love that. It's two hours long. It's a long time. But it's four different speakers. And um, I'll, I'll just real quick tell you, the first uh, speaker is a brain surgeon. And when he was learning to be a brain surgeon at his residency, his mother was in the hospital dying of cancer at the same time. And he talked about how he used to be so in awe of the brain, and he still is. And when he held one in his hand, he thought about what it could do. And um, when he was sitting with his mother, after, after every day, he'd go back as a resident, he could do whatever he wanted. And he'd go back and sit with his mother and they'd talk or listen to music or whatever. So it was pretty nice. And so um, he was back there with her one night and she wasn't responding. She's just lying there. And very peacefully, and he thought, this might be it. So he just sat down, just waited, just sat with her, just part of what they used to do together. And then there was that moment, and he said to himself, well, that was it. That was it. And he's just sitting there. He's a very patient man. Did brain surgery for 47 years. Very skilled man. And after two or three minutes, she picked up her head and she looked at him and he said, honey, I just want you to know there's nothing to be scared of. Oh, she was dead. Isn't it? Yeah, yeah. So that was one of the stories that got my attention. And uh, another story is uh, there's a forensic pathologist who talks there. And, uh, she gave proof that consciousness is not limited to the brain it's somewhere else out there the the brain is the transmitter receiver and then there was gabby who's just precious and then there was a death door and i was watching the part about the death door and i didn't think well, that's really interesting or i want to more do no more i was more like a child i want to do that that's it and so i'm doing it i just knew that that was something that i wanted to do so that that was the one that got me, and it's it's hard to get to. It's long and it's free, so try it. You might like it. Everyone I've gotten to watch it liked it. 
um, for dual skills, I went on to take my um, certification and understand that the certification doesn't mean anything other than the place that you went to school certifies that you learned what you're supposed to learn. It's not required for any licensure or things like that. This profession is not at that point. And I hope that it never gets there because then it's going to be cookie cutter. So I went to the University of Vermont Medical School. And the person who created that program, she's now doing something else at the University of Vermont, Frances Arnold wrote a book called Cultivating the Doula Heart. And it's wonderful. It's a little book. It's like a third or a quarter to the size of this. Mm. And it just frames it and anchors it so you can you know what a doula, how a doula needs to think to respond, to be able to respond effectively. Um, so you can get it from her website or you can get it on um, uh, Amazon or eBay. And it's the kind of book that I take it out and just reread it every now and then, as I do with my favorite books, just to remind me of considerations. And then my other favorite is um, Sarah Kerr up in, uh, up in Canada with the Sacred Death Care. And she has a very soulful approach. A lot of honor the ancestors, a lot of have ritual because ritual helps to lead you through what you want to do. And um, a lot of spiritual content to what she does. And her, her work is also very practical. It's, she's got one up there right now. It's four little videos. I think they're like 16 minutes all together on how to talk to dying people and what you say and what you don't say. So they're very practical. Uh, for skills, so I highly recommend that. And she has some classes which I've taken, which are excellent. But she has a lot of free stuff on her website. What is her name? Sarah Kerr. Sarah uh, S A R A H. Is that um, on there? I'm trying to see it. Um, yeah. You know, her name's not on there. But when I send this along, I will actually edit. I'll add that to it. Thank Sarah you. Kerr, her name, absolutely. Thank you. But her. Her um, website was on here. Yes. So it, it, yeah, you'll, you'll have the website there. So she's just wonderful. And she has <coughs> lived what she teaches. So she's great. Um, and what was a side note, Gabby Jimenez so gives the death door tool. So I already mentioned that to work. Um, and people can have a feeling of, I did that. I loved him well. And that talk about unfinished business. Somebody's gone. You do the best you can for them while they're here. You carry that in your heart. So that is your introduction to the death though. Any questions? Thoughts? Yes. Yeah. Oh, you are required um, to speak. Hearing, and I've heard some of this because. You we know, talk, talk right. a lot of time together. But do you know if our medical students required to take some sort of a course mm. that would emphasize the need for them to be hospitable and, and comforting and caring and to address the needs not just of their patient, but the patient's loved ones at the end of life? There it is, it is not required. I hope it will get there. It, it used to be, and these are people kind of in our age group. This one guy was sitting talking to a patient um, that had trouble to relating, but so he, I think she had a cake and she wanted him to have some cake. So they sat there eating cake together and talking. Finally, at last, he was talking and he was reprimanded. You know, you don't really do sit down on the cake or sit down on the bed, you know, sit on the cake either. Um, you don't do that. You don't get that friendly with the client. So I don't think they're being reprimanded anymore, but I don't think there's any requirement one way or the other, but we're getting there. Um, and doctors are taking note. It's wonderful that this came from the med school. This didn't come from an outside thing. And this is a leading school in this field. 
So every step. Yeah, but wouldn't that be wonderful? If they, it's, it's easy not to talk to someone who's dying if you don't know how to do it because it's uncomfortable. If you know how to do it, it's absolutely fascinating. I can imagine, I, him and I have the same position. Mm -hmm. And um, I can imagine that he would have a very easy time relating to the patient at the end of life because he's he's a spiritual person. He's extremely warm and cares so deeply about the individuals. Mm -hmm. But um, I mean, we all know doctors would have been that we couldn't imagine them hearing on a conversation like that. Yeah, yeah. So, well, the other question I have is... Um, so let me just interrupt for a minute. Um, ben was a physician for Dars mm -hmm. Mason, who was buried right up there. Mm -hmm. And when she was in hospice, and it was clear that she was going to make it, she still wasn't talking about that. And so he said to her, uh, Dars, you know that you're dying. And she said, oh, I know. So, so there's a physician who says it comfortably and friendly and directly. And with this particular patient, who was just, was just wonderful. I know. And that was the end of that conversation. Then they just went on with their current thoughts. So, yeah, he's perfect. I know you've had a really good friend who, um, whom you visited in recent years. And I don't know if you've had a really good friend who, um, whom you visited in recent years. And I don't know if you've had a really and I know you made a number of visits there. If his family or loved ones were there and you talked to them, even if you weren't officially deaf to at that time, could you see a response from them? Yeah. Well, I mean, yeah. Say, this is helpful and or I hadn't thought about that or just a general comfort you were giving them. Yes. Yeah. And that and that's that's a wonderful question because you you don't do it officially you know well have you considered such and so it's just like I was talking to one of you um and you know a lot of good conversations you feed back to someone what they just said to you and what it sounded to you it's that sort of thing and sometimes they'll thank you and sometimes they just sort of ah, relax because they can speak their fears and be understood. Not well, given the permission, mm -hmm. almost. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, very much so, given them permission. Thank you. Yeah. So they're really great skills to have. You never know when you're going to need them. But when occasions arise, and it's not even like it's, you're not learning how to make a chair, but they're just general conversational and listening skills, which serve you in all kinds of ways. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I'm very surprised. You you said this a couple of times that the system sort of supports treating dying people as if they are already like halfway out the door or as if they don't, that they're not an active part of their own dying process or that they are not um, taking an active role in that. Um, I'm sorry, I'm just surprised that that wasn't really a question from all students. Yeah, well, I think it's getting better yeah. because of Elizabeth. Uh, I think the answer, that, and this is me, this is absolutely me talking, that in the hospital, the answer to everything is take this medicine, it might work, and then take this one to counteract what that one did, and so on and so forth. And they call them the psychiatrist, and I don't see any mental interaction going on um and they rule mm -hmm. and if they say you should have this you're going to get it unless one of the family members has done her homework um and says no i know about that that doesn't work for him and even then sometimes they'll slip it in for them. and this happened with the guy i'm working with right now uh it's horrifying it's like he belongs to me and when you're not here we're going to do what we want to do so it's really horrifying. Be prepared. But part of being prepared is being able to ask the questions and, and to see what the results are. Mm -hmm. um, the person is calling for the police because they're so upset with the way they feel. That's that's a clue not to be ignored, mm -hmm. not to be masked with another sedative of some sort. Empowering us all to take ownership over that experience. 
versus yes. letting it happen around being sort of a passive part of a passive dyer versus an active dyer. Right. <laughs> we want to be there. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. thank you. Any questions? Thank you for coming. It's one of my favorite topics. I love to talk about it. And um, Bree and I are hoping we can stir up some more interest to do some future programs. Yay! Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Pam. Yeah. Mwah. Mwah, mwah. Uh, we will list um, all of our upcoming programs on the website. Pam has another event in July. Right. We're going to be talking about green burial. Um, and oh, and you will get an email from me probably in the next half hour, if we're totally honest, with um, the, the resources. And I'll make sure that um, Gabby Jimenez's name is included and also Sarah Kerr. Was there anything else I can send along in that email that you were interested in? Maybe the date of Pam's next chat. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Mm -hmm. So, and, okay. and check everything out. It's, it's great. And then call me and we'll talk. Yeah. So.